murdered nine people in South Carolina uh, in an African-American church just a few weeks ago. Um, he is reported to have often had quite racist, uh, made racist comments, particularly towards blacks, and wanted to ignite a race war in, in the United States. It doesn't look, doesn't look particularly happy there because he looks a bit of a, an angry man. But Dylan's views are markedly different from those, from those shown by his victims, as several relatives from these attacks of the nine people slain inside this church in, uh, in South Carolina, um, they appeared and they addressed Dylan while he was in court. The family members of the dead told him of their pain and anguish of losing their loved ones. But they also said that they would forgive him. They said that they would forgive him. One, one victim said, I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you. A daughter of one victim said, we have no room for hating, so we have to forgive. Uh, and another said, I pray God in your soul. It's difficult, isn't it? It's really difficult. I don't know whether you've ever thought about how you would react if you were in that same situation, <coughs> how awful it would be to have a loved one killed, um, and whether whether you could forgive. Um, but it was so remarkable, that forgiveness was so remarkable, it earned praise from President uh, Obama, no less. Uh, and the world looks on these acts of forgiveness, Christian forgiveness, and finds them very hard to understand, finds them virtually impossible to understand. How can somebody forgive when they have been so terribly wronged? These people going to the church have done nothing wrong. They didn't deserve for this man to come in and kill them or kill their relatives. doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't seem natural to be able to forgive somebody who's done something so wrong. I think forgiveness is quite often a subject that can be overlooked, in Christian circles, but it is very, very important. It is important because God thinks it's important. That's why it's important. You only have to read the Lord's Prayer to understand this. Forgive us our sins as we ha also forgive those who have sinned against us. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. Or read Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. I think these passages show us that forgiveness is vital in, uh, as Christians. It's not something that we just do now and again. It's something that we should be continually doing. We are to keep on forgiving others. So I want us now to turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses, uh, starting at verse 21. So that's page 985. So we'll look into this a little bit more. Matthew chapter 18, it's page 985 in the Church Bibles, starting at verse 21. Okay. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Okay, so the passage starts off, as we've already had a bit of a discussion on with the kids, 
uh, with Peter asking Jesus a fairly straightforward question. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Peter probably thinking that he was being quite, uh, quite generous. And Jesus, maybe, maybe he was wanting praise from Jesus, thinking, well, Jesus will praise me for being so generous. Yes, I'll get, uh, you know, look at me and my generosity. But as is often the case, Jesus was replied with quite a shocking statement. Not seven times, but 77 times. And actually that word 77, uh, I've seen it written in other places, really uh, times without ending. Um, so it's really that 77 means without ending. It's, uh, you know, you should never stop. Um, and yet the implication is clearly that we should not keep a notebook or a log of how many times we've forgiven somebody and those dying, yes, I've forgiven this person 10 times, right, I think I've forgiven them enough now, I'm just going to hold a grudge. Uh, it's the exact opposite. We should not keep a record of wrongs. We should not keep a record of wrongs. It tells us that in Corinthians, and hence we should keep on forgiving without ceasing. There's no limit to how many times we should forgive. Peter's original question assumed that there's always a limit which can be counted in some sort of legalistic way. If I forgive ten, seven times, that's it, I've done my duty, done my bit. Of course, that's not how the gospel operates, is it? There's no limit to God's forgiveness to us through Christ Jesus. And hence, there should be no limit to how often we should forgive others. We're not saved by doing our duty, but saved by grace through faith, not through our own works. Therefore, we are not to limit our own, uh, limit the grace and hence forgiveness we show to others. To reinforce the point, Jesus then taught them this parable which we're going to look at, uh, that we've just read about the unmerciful servant, that may be titled in your Bible, the unmerciful servant. A parable is, I'm sure many of you know, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So we'll try and understand a bit about the heavenly meaning, the, the heavenly meaning today. Uh, and I've split this into three, three sections. I thought this is my final slide, it's not very exciting, but these are the three sections. The man was a debtor, he was a creditor, and then he became a prisoner. So we're just going to start off by looking at um, the first few verses, verses 23 to 27. He was a debtor. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with what uh, issues debt can cause. Uh, one of the biggest issues in recent history is clearly what's going on in Greece and what has been going on in the last few weeks. Greece has managed to amass a debt pile that is nearly twice its annual income much bigger than most other countries, a level of debt that most economists think is completely unsustainable. They'll never be able to pay it back. Um, however, no one seems keen to write it off, do they? No one's willing to say, right, let's write this off. No, Germans particularly not interested. No, you should repay everything. And why are they not interested in writing it off? They're not interested in writing it off because of course, someday it's going to have to pay the price for writing off that debt, aren't they? Uh, and that doesn't seem fair for somebody else to write off uh, uh, somebody else's debt. It's not fair, does it? Well, the man in the story has got an unsustainable level of personal debt, a bit like Greece, except on a personal level. He owes the king 10,000 talents. That's what it tells us. He owes the king 10,000 talents. Now, it is thought that a talent amounted to 6,000 de denarii, which would take the average worker 20 years to earn, okay? Therefore, now I've done this calculation, may not be 100% correct, uh, but it gives you, it's more an indication. <laughs> Therefore, 10,000 talents would amount to five billion pounds in today's money, yeah, okay? An absolutely astronomical sum of money, okay? Absolutely an astronomical sum. How, how the man got into this situation, we're not told. Maybe he was responsible for collecting the taxes for the king in one of the provinces, and he hadn't delivered. We don't know why. Um, but it's not really that important how he got into this situation. We just know he's got a level of debt which he can never pay back. So the man was not unable to pay, and so the king orders that he and his family are sold into slavery with the proceeds going to repay some of the debt. Not uncommon in those times for people to be sold into slavery if they couldn't repay the debt. It's quite a common thing to happen. Um, but the servant pleads. The servant pleads to the king. He says, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. That's what he says. Be patient with me and I will pay back everything. And a last ditch of payment. But you see, his appeal was a lie because he could never pay it back. There was no chance of him ever paying back five billion pounds in today's money. There was no chance. It was completely, the amount was much too big. 
But he, uh, he made the plea anyway, and his plea was successful. The king showed mercy to him, didn't he? The Bible tells us that the king took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. Well, the parallel between this story and our relationship with God is striking, isn't it? God is like the king, and we are like the servant, who have a debt that we can never repay. That's the principle, our debt we can never repay. Our debt is the sin that we have committed, just like the king does not treat the servant as he, as he deserves, we are not treated as we deserve. We are shown great mercy by God. If we turn to God in repentance and faith, our debt is wiped clean and we are set free from the bondage of sin. Only through the Lord Jesus and his saving work on the cross can we find forgiveness from sin. And just like the man in the story, what a large debt of sins we all have. Paul tells us in Romans that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. That includes us. We are godless and wicked at heart. Do you view your sin, do you view your sin as equating to a debt of five billion pounds that we could never repay? Or do you think of your debt as quite small? Because maybe you're not really, maybe we're not really that bad. Uh, well, think again, no one can repay their debt. We all need God's forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. And asking for God's forgiveness is not a one-off event. We need to continue doing so. As Christians, we continue to sin, don't we? Anyone who says they are without sin is a liar, tells us in the Bible. We need to keep turning back to God, repenting of our sin and asking for forgiveness. It's also important to note that forgiveness is, is costly, as I've already mentioned. It cost the king a lot of money to forgive the servant's debt. It cost him a lot of money. It also cost God a lot to forgive us. It? it cost him the death of his only son on the cross. Forgiveness costs. We thank God that he was prepared to pay the cost for us through the Lord Jesus. The challenge to us is, us, are we prepared for the cost required to forgive others? Are we prepared to forgive them even though maybe they don't apologise? Or forgive even when they have caused us much hurt? Our forgiveness costs God and it will cost us also. So the second part is uh, moving on, verses 28 to uh, 30. So the servant was a debtor, but he was also a creditor. So this is quite a lot of accounting speak. I am an accountant, so I quite enjoyed this. Um, he's also a creditor. So the servant must have been relieved of being shown such mercy. Clearly, he must have been very happy, very relieved. He'd been let off, he had escaped slavery, must have been overjoyed, mustn't he? Must have been overjoyed. However, the old saying that one good turn deserves another was certainly uh, not in his head. As he went out and found a fellow servant who owed him money and immediately demanded repayment. The fellow servant, it should be noticed, responded in virtually the same way as he had done previously. He responds in virtually the same way. He says, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. The only difference being that this man probably could pay him back as the size of the debt was 100 denarii, which in today's money is equivalent of around 8,000 pounds. So 5 billion, 8,000, that's the sort of level of proportional difference. However, the servant didn't show him any mercy at all. As so as we can see, didn't show him any mercy and had him thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. He couldn't sell him to slavery because the debt wasn't big enough, but he could put him into prison. Now, one of my responsibilities at work is to ensure that the company's invoices are paid um, every month I review the list of those organisations who haven't paid up and take action if appropriate. Um, if debt is overview, then obviously and we've been asking the customer to pay, and you need to pay your debts if you're overdue, then we may send them a legal letter and ultimately, if they don't pay, we will take legal action against them. You know, it's a business fundamental that you get paid what you're owed. It's reasonable, isn't it? So if this incident was taken in isolation, it's not unreasonable, really, for the man to ask for the debt to be repaid, is it, if it's overdue? And I think we can often think like this, can't we? We can think in isolation. Have you been in a situation where somebody has said something mean about you, or you haven't been listened to, or your rights infringed? Our, right, our natural reaction is to get even, isn't it? To get even, not to forgive. We want justice. We don't want to give mercy. However, when you put this episode next to uh, the amazing mercy that has been shown by the king, it makes the servant's action look so wrong, doesn't it? So it's the two have to be looked together. 
In the same way, petty grudges about minor incidents are unjustified when put in the context, the context of how much God has forgiven us. Do we hold unforgiveness in our hearts, maybe against someone in church? Maybe due to something relatively minor? Or maybe you're involved in a long-standing family dispute? can be very sad. I have one in my family. There's an unforgiveness between two of my uncles. And not resolved. Terribly sad. They don't, don't talk to each other. They don't, don't say sorry. Um, but they think that's right. They think what they're doing is right. But whenever you look at it in the context of what God has done for us, there should be forgiveness. Maybe God is laying on your heart the need to forgive someone this morning and to stop the anger and bitterness against them. We can't do this on our own. Forgiveness is frequently be, uh, beyond us and we need to ask for God's help, don't we? Through the Holy Spirit. And God will help you if you ask for it uh, because he wants us to forgive. He wants us to forgive. Um, so this passage is all about forgiveness. So at this point, I just want to explain what forgiveness is not before we moving on to look at what forgiveness is. Okay? So forgiveness is not approving of what has happened. God never approves of sin. God never approves of sin. We can forgive someone, but not approve of what they have done. This means that you do not need to pardon someone if they have broken the law, but you could still forgive them. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. They're two different things. Reconciliation means that both parties have had their relationship restored. It may be the case that you've fallen out with someone and your relationship with them is damaged. You can forgive them, but that does not mean that you're reconciled to them. It takes both parties to want to be reconciled together, and so sometimes reconciliation is not possible, but forgiveness is. And forgiveness is not forgetting what's happened. People like to speak of forgiving and forgetting, but actually forgetting is not easy. Forgetting is not easy or even possible to do. Even God does not forget our sins. He chooses not to remember them. In the same way, we cannot necessarily forget the times people have wronged us, but we can choose not to remember them. A classic example is in married life. If I upset Colette, I, I apologise and she hopefully forgives me. However, if she were to bring the incident up in the future, then that would show that she hasn't really forgiven me. Yeah. So true forgiveness is not, uh, is not bringing it up again. If you've truly forgiven somebody, you don't bring it up again. Okay, so... Um, he, he was a debtor, he was a creditor, and finally, the unmerciful servant became a prisoner in verses 31 to 34. The servant's lack of mercy or forgiveness to his fellow servant who owed him money was witnessed by others, and so the passage tells us they were greatly distressed, greatly distressed, and went and told their master everything that had happened. The second meeting that the servant had with the king was not so pleasant, or even less pleasant than the first meeting. The king is angry. He calls the servant wicked and pronounces that he should be turned over to the jailers and tortured on each, until he paid back everything he owed. Clearly his debt was so large that this was never going to be possible, as we've said before. And so this torture was everlasting, uh, everlasting punishment. He was never going to be able to repay what he owed. So ironically, the, un the unforgiving servant was thrown into prison. He wanted justice for the servant who owed him money but he ended up getting justice for himself. Jesus goes on in verse 35 to warn that unless we forgive others from our hearts, then God the Father will not forgive us. So this is quite a, quite a difficult verse um, uh, about if we don't forgive others, then God won't forgive us. Uh, and just let, let me make one point clear. Uh, this passage doesn't mean if we don't forgive others, then we will lose our salvation. It can't possibly mean that uh, and have everlasting punishment. That, that is not the meaning of this passage. Because if it did, then the gospel would be a gospel of works rather than of grace. It would all be our uh, going to heaven would all be contingent upon us forgiving somebody, which it's not. So it does not mean that we are no longer Christians if we don't forgive somebody. That, that is not, that is not what, it, what it means. But the seriousness of unforgiveness is, in clear, uh, is clear, and it has serious consequences. The first consequence of not forgiving is that the Holy Spirit is grieved, because we are sinning by not forgiving other people. It says in Ephesians 4 that we are not to grieve the, the Holy Spirit. 
And that is important because he is our helper and our guide, and yet our relationship with him will be damaged if we do not forgive, which means we are left a bit more to ourselves, and it's much more likely that the devil will get in. If our relationship with the Holy Spirit is damaged, then we're more open to the devil's temptations, and he can and will take advantage. So our relationship with the Spirit is weakened if we don't forgive, but so is our relationship with our Heavenly Father, with the Lord Jesus. The level of fellowship we experience will not be the same because the sin of an unrepentant heart has come between us. Fellowship with God is one of the greatest privileges we have as Christians, to know God as our Father and to have the Lord Jesus as our friend, and to be able to speak to them through prayer. It is wonderful, and yet that relationship is damaged if we don't forgive others. And unforgiveness also builds up in the form of bitterness, doesn't it? Bitterness, hatred, vengefulness. The unforgiveness harbours in our soul whenever we don't forgive others. It weakens our relationship with God, and really it hence causes us to become a prisoner to it. Um, a well-known American, preach, uh, American preacher puts it like this, the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. The world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. If we refuse to forgive others, then we are only imprisoning ourselves and causing, causing our own torment. So we went through what forgiveness was not earlier in the sermon. Let me touch on a couple of the practical pointers to forgiving others. Firstly, don't tell anybody what the other person has done. Clearly, this does not apply if the law has been broken against you, and in some circumstances it might be good to discuss it with somebody from sort of therapeutic counselling type reasons. But the principle is that if we truly forgive somebody for what they've done, we don't need to tell others about it. Because if we do, uh, we're really showing that we're trying to get revenge on them and hurt them, and that we haven't really forgiven them. Yeah, I'm sure we've had scenarios of that. You want to say, oh, you wouldn't have guessed what so-and-so has done to me, blah, 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 blah. And really, you're just trying to uh, downtrod their character and make yourself feel better. But if you've truly forgiven them, you won't go and do that. Secondly, don't bring anything up which makes them feel guilty. Again, it can feel good to remind someone of the wrong they've done in the past. It's another way for us to get revenge and hence shows that we haven't really forgiven. I've done it plenty of time. Maybe other people have done it as well when you're maybe arguing, just to bring this example again with your spouse. We can have long memories when it comes to our husband or wife's feelings, can't we? Um, Joseph is a great biblical example in this area. His brother sold him into slavery and he spent many years in a foreign country away from his family. He surely had the right to be bitter and angry against his brothers for what they'd done to him. But when he finally, re uh, finally revealed himself to them in Egypt, he said, do not be angry with yourselves. He would not allow his brothers to feel guilty. And this is a choice we must make as well. It's hard, but this is what we would want if things were reversed. <coughs> and thirdly, we must keep on forgiving. We must keep on forgiving. Forgiveness does not necessarily happen by saying, I forgive you. Sometimes a child will say, you know, something, you know, I forgive you, or say sorry, but do they really mean it? And that's it. The feelings of anger and bitterness may return if it's something significant. The, bitter, the feelings of anger and bitterness may return. Maybe a certain event will trigger the memories and all the negative feelings will come back. They'll all come back. So we need to continue forgiving others, maybe daily for what has happened. It's not easy. And lastly, we should pray for those who have um, sinned against us. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. John Calvin said that this is exceedingly difficult and another theologian describes it as the highest summit of self-control. We should pray that God will forgive them and bless and prosper them. The ultimate example of this is the Lord Jesus. He had been deserted by his friends, uh, wrongly convicted of wrongdoing, mocked and insulted, and then dying a most painful death on the cross. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. What a powerful example that is. An amazing example of forgiveness in the face of the most unjust punishment imaginable. We should ask God to help follow his example. So what have we thought about then in this parable of the unmerciful servant? God's forgiveness of us through the Lord Jesus is the greatest example of forgiveness. We all have large debts of sin, which we can never repay, but God has forgiven us through Jesus. 
But like the unmerciful servant, we all need to forgive others, which shows mercy and love in the same way that God shows it to us. Lastly, if we don't forgive, we risk becoming a prisoner to the sin of unforgiveness. Like the unmerciful servant became a prisoner, we will weaken our fellowship with God and risk backsliding into other sin. Now, I buy the Times newspaper every Saturday, pretty much every Saturday, and it contains a column written by Matthew Paris, an ex-MP. He wrote on the topic of forgiveness a few weeks ago. You can see the title there, To Hell with the Foolish Idea of Forgiveness. That was the title, To Hell with the Foolish Idea of Forgiveness. That was uh, July the 18th this year. And he says, and in it he says, can you forgive? It's a question people are forever asking of someone who has been horribly wrong. I have never understood it. I do not know what the word forgive means. This is a very intelligent man. I do not know what the word forgive means. I wonder whether anyone does. He goes on to write about Oscar Groening. It's the man in this, this picture here. The 94-year-old Nazi who worked at Auschwitz where thousands of Jews were slaughtered. Could any of the victims' families forgive? Was his question. Could any of the victims' families forgive? He concluded, no, couldn't do it. And I tell you this morning that through the Holy Spirit's help, by looking to Jesus' example, and by remembering how much God has forgiven us, we can indeed forgive others, even for the most terrible things. It won't be easy, but we must always look at our sin that God has forgiven to realise that the forgiveness of others pales into insignificance in comparison. With God's help, we can forgive, we must forgive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you came to earth to live amongst us and to die for us so that our sins can be forgiven. We recognise that we could never repay our debt of sin. It is far beyond us. Our own good works do not even come close to achieving it. We praise and thank you for your grace and love to each of us. We also, uh, we also ask for your help in forgiving others as you have forgiven us. We recognise that we are quick to hold grudges and harbour resentment to others who may have caused us hurt, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Please may your Holy Spirit work within us so that our hearts are loving and gracious to others, so that we can forgive them. Help us to model the ultimate example of the Lord Jesus, and he forgive those who were crucifying him in the cross unjustly. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let's just spend a minute thinking about um, any areas of unforgiveness in our own hearts. finished by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.